the stage is yours. Great. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, welcome, everyone, also from my side. Uh, let me perhaps start by thanking Professor Schulman and also Professor Weidner for the kind invitation. It's certainly a great pleasure to be here and also a great pleasure and a great honor at the same time um, to speak uh, in such a distinguished and esteemed colloquium series. And I'm really looking forward to the next 50 or 60 minutes. Now, I always like to define at the beginning of my talks the goals um, of the meeting, and um, this talk shall be no exception to this rule. I have three goals, more or less, in my slides. The first goal is, uh, as Professor Schulman already mentioned in the abstract, to introduce you to this recent security and also cryptographic primitive of a physical unclonable function, or PUF for short. Hopefully, I will succeed in transporting some of the fascination that many of us share for this area in these days. Then the second goal is to highlight the special relation between POFs and the Internet of Things. Um, the Internet of Things, as we all know, is one of the most massive endeavors that mankind has ever undertaken, and it creates a very, very special attack landscape. And it seems to me, and I hope that I can convince you of that fact, that POFs are almost tailor-made for that very special attack landscape and the very special attack vectors that arise in the Internet of Things. And the third goal, I will very briefly maybe in just 10 minutes in one section of the talk, give you a, a short overview in a spotlight type style of my own research activities at LMU Munich and at the University of Connecticut. Now, these three goals then translate into the following outline or agenda of the talk. I will start in my first section by giving you some introduction on the physical phenomenon that underlies the entire research area of POFs. This physical phenomenon is called physical disorder. We will deal with the IoT and its various security challenges in the second section of the talk. The third section will merge these two strands and will tell you how physical disorder can be applied to boost and to propel IoT security. Section four will then deal with my own research and we will conclude by, section, by a summary in section five. Good, then let's get started with physical disorder. What is physical disorder all about? Um, if you would take a microscope and examine the small scale structure of all the objects that are present in your room, the chairs, the tables, the floor, the ceiling, the walls, the windows, just anything, then you would find that the small scale structures of these objects on a micrometer scale level or on a nanometer scale level is not perfectly smooth, but to the contrary, it's random, imperfect, unique, or in one word, physically disordered. And two particularly striking examples I've put on the slide here, paper, which is an everyday medium that we are used to since our childhood days, nevertheless has this very rich and faceted structure with paper fibers being interwoven with each other in a very complex fashion. And nothing less holds and can be said about a special type of clay in German, crimson clover, which in set dimension has perhaps even yet a richer disorder than the relatively planar paper surface that I'm showing here. Now, the same phenomenon also applies to man-made objects and it applies to electronic objects. For example, two CDs that store exactly the same digital information content, exactly the same Madonna or Robbie Williams songs or whatever your favorite artist may be even if they store exactly the same digital content, then they still have a unique appearance on a sub-digital level. On an analog level, each of these CDs, even though it stores the same digital information content as the others, will have a unique um, and partly random and disordered appearance. And the same also applies for many computer chips. So actually for all computer chips, they're also subject to small random manufacturing variations that are uncontrollable for their own manufacturer. Now, why is that interesting from a security perspective? Where's the security relevance of this phenomenon? Well, it's interesting because such physically disordered systems are very hard to duplicate or to clone, even for their original manufacturer. So even the original manufacturer of this paper surface here will find it very, very hard or basically impossible in practice to produce two specimen, two instances that are exactly the same and that have exactly the same structure. And the reason is that the technology for perfect duplication in three dimensions simply does not exist yet. Maybe in 300 years, maybe in a Star Trek universe, <laughs> but right now on planet Earth in the year 2023, the technology for perfect duplication just doesn't exist yet. And that gives us a very high security level, right? It's not just a matter of accessing or possessing the right technology, but instead that the security against cloning or against refabrication for such a structure is based on the fact that the technology for perfect duplication simply does not exist yet. 
Um, another interesting aspect that I always like to highlight at the beginning of my talk is that this phenomenon of physical disorder usually is considered an unwanted phenomenon or perhaps even a nuisance. If you would talk to circuit engineers at Intel trying to downscale their technologies, or if you would talk to the nanophysicists next door at TU Darmstadt or at Goethe University at Frankfurt, they would tell you that they fight the occurrence of disorder in every single day of their working life. So to them, disorder is not a friend, but it's a foe. Um, and the question that I'm asking in my research and that many colleagues all around the planet are asking together with me in these days is, can we exploit this omnipresent phenomenon constructively as well? Is it good for something? To. And of course, the answer is yes, because otherwise I would be giving this talk. And let me tell you in the next 45 minutes or so how we can exploit this phenomenon of physical disorder in a security context. Now, before I do so, let's take a small detour. Let's talk a little bit about the Internet of Things. Um, as I already mentioned, I think it's one of the most massive endeavors that mankind has ever undertaken. Um, 42 billion connected things by 2025, at least that's the prediction. That's about five things, five connected things per human being on the planet. 80 setabytes of data collected every year. And if you don't know what a setabyte is, I had to look it up. I didn't know it. A setabyte is 10 to the power of 21 bytes. So 80 setabytes of data per year. And of course, it goes without saying that this allows previously unseen services. It's a brave new world out there, as Aldous Huxley probably would say. But at the same time, it also causes unprecedented security issues. And the core technical issue that we have to solve here is how can we achieve security with highly connected, mobile, lightweight, inexpensive, and resource-constrained devices? Um, I think it's this mixture of attributes, highly connected, mobile, lightweight, inexpensive, resource-constrained. It's this mixture of attributes that creates a very, very complex attack landscape. But at the same time, since we want to save on resources and on costs and on weight, it does not leave too much leeway for protective measures. And I think it's fair to say that the current way we're planning and envisioning the Internet of Things really takes classical security design recipes to their limits. And let me explain a little bit more on that. What are these classical design recipes in the first place? And why do I believe that you know, they are reaching their limits, especially in the IoT? Well, the way we build classical security hardware, more or less in a sketchy way, in an abstract way, could be described as follows. Um, so we store a secret key in non-volatile memory permanently, permanently. So the secret key sits in non-volatile memory or in NVM all the time in digital form. And whenever the key is needed, it's processed by some crypto algorithm. It's transported or transferred to the crypto algorithm, and then the crypto algorithm does something smart, hopefully, with the key. That's the idea. And then another implicit assumption in the way we now build security hardware is that there is some saint-like figure with blue eyes and a tie and a nice jacket, namely the manufacturer. <laughs> and this manufacturer has no own interests whatsoever uh, and just faithfully builds the security hardware without changing anything about the hardware or without building in any backdoors. Now, this vanilla scenario, of course, uh, is far from, from true in practice. Um, and for this reason, classical design recipes are reaching their limits, especially in the IoT. For example, non-volatile memory or NVM is not in every hardware in the Internet of Things. If you think about FPGAs or other lightweight systems, especially cost-effective systems, they might not have NVM on board. So where would you store the key then? That's the first obvious question to ask. Um, a second obvious question to ask is any security mechanism, any security algorithm costs you space and energy in the system. So unfortunately, these are particularly scarce resources in the Internet of Things. So how can we save on cost um, and space and on energy? Um, a third aspect that, you know, deviates from this vanilla scenario and from this perfect world that I've sketched before is that these keys that are stored, transported and then used can be extracted in various ways by adversaries. So they can be attacked or extracted from the NVM where they are stored. They can be extracted while they are in transit to the crypto algorithm, and they can be uh, deduced from the power consumption or the electromagnetic emanation of the crypto algorithm. So they can be extracted in various ways, as Paul Kocher and many others in the last 30 years have shown us. 
And last but not least, um, the idea of a saint-like figure, a fully trusted manufacturer, is a bit of a myth. I think it's pretty unrealistic in practice. In practice, most of these manufacturers um, will be wearing shady glasses and a tie at the same time. So they're partly trustworthy, but also partly have their own interests. And therefore, the idea of a fully trusted manufacturer, I think, um, is not realistic anymore in these days. Professor Schulman has already hinted at it at the very beginning in her intro, and I fully agree with this. It's one of the biggest problems that we're faced with at the moment, these manufacturers who are wearing shady glasses and ties at the same time. Now, let me perhaps make one example <clears throat> that you know illustrates uh, the situation very vividly. And the example that I would like to make is the so-called war on secret keys, as I call it. And by war on secret keys, I mean this decade-long fight between secret key extractors and secret key protectors in hardware that has been going on for a very long time. And I think sometimes <laughs> this is reminiscent of a, a comic situation almost, where each side keeps on hitting the other side back and forth. It started all in the 1990s, one could say, with Paul Kocher's famous and celebrated works on uh, timing attacks and also differential power analysis. Then, of course, the code makers and the secret key protectors were hitting back. They were publishing papers on how to protect your cryptographic implementation uh, against these attacks by Paul Kocher. And I think then it's fair to say that the back and forth was going on for a while. And the latest two beasts or the latest two hits were made by the attackers, actually. Meltdown and Spectres, uh, Spectre, uh, two of the most famous um, microarchitectural attacks that have been published just a few years ago. And that are so impactful and so massive and so strong that they led uh, the New York Times actually to almost concluding that all of the world's computers are insecure. So the headline here says researchers discover two major flaws in the world's computers headline in the New York Times uh, in 2018. And I think this could go on forever, right? Because people will always find new ways of extracting the keys and then new ways of protecting the keys and then again new ways of extracting the keys. But the question that I'm trying to pose in my own research is can we alter the situation fundamentally it's a question here at this point of the talk only, can we alter the situation fundamentally by throwing in a new security resource, namely physical disorder? So can we change something about this cat and mouse game by exploiting this phenomenon that I've shown on the earlier slides, the disorder that occurs in paper or in computer chips or in many, many other everyday objects? That's the question. And let me try to illustrate in the third section of my talk um, by one concrete example how this can be done, how we can exploit physical disorder in security applications. And this concrete example will be the example of a strong physical unclonable function. And let me tell you something about this at the beginning of the section. And let me start, first of all, by a general explanation of the concept of a physical unclonable function or PUF. So the idea about a PUF is that you have a disordered an unclonable physical system, similar to the systems that I've shown at the beginning of my talk, right? The paper surface or the, um, the computer chip, for example. And then we assume that the system can be stimulated from the outside or challenged from the outside by applying some external stimulus signal. People in the PUF community call this signal a challenge, challenge CI. And then the system reacts by producing a corresponding response RI. This RI shall be a function of the applied challenge and of the specific disorder that is present in the system, right? So every puff would have its own unique disorder that distinguishes it from any other puff. And the response that I get here when I apply that challenge is a function of the challenge and of the unique disorder in this system. And these input output pairs of the PUF or the challenge response pairs as PUF researchers call them, uh, they're written as CI comma RI and abbreviated as CRP. And this is an abbreviation or an acronym that you might want to remember because it appears very frequently throughout the talk. CRP means challenge response pair. Now, it has turned out over time that there's a whole zoo of different puffs that is inhabited by all kinds of species, weak puffs, strong puffs, complex puffs, simple systems, public puffs, etc., etc. I'm also guilty of introducing some of these funny names, so you can also blame me for that confusion and that confusing terminology. Um, but this talk, fortunately, will focus mostly on strong puffs. So we will focus on one particular puff concept, on one inhabitant of the zoo, you could say. Uh, it's one of the oldest inhabitants, one of the most traditional uh, inhabitants, and perhaps also one of the most useful inhabitants, these strong puffs. 
And since I focus on strong paths, let me spend some time on the next slide to explaining what strong paths are all about. So strong paths, of course, as the name already says, are also paths. Um, so they are disordered and unclonable systems. They have this challenge response behavior defined upon them. But apart from this basic path behavior, they have a number of specific features that distinguish them from any other paths. And these specific features are, first of all, strong paths have very many possible challenges, ideally exponentially many in some system parameter, but not necessarily. Um, the main thing is that it's a huge number of possible challenges, whether it's exponential or high degree polynomial, it doesn't really matter. Um, then the second feature, strong paths should have a highly complex challenge response relation. So this behavior um, that maps challenges into responses or the function that maps challenges into responses should be very complex. So complex that no machine learning or numeric prediction of unknown responses is possible, even if many CRPs of the puff are known to the adversary. Um, so you probably know the basic setting that you would have in machine learning. You have an unknown function and then you feed in some input output pairs from that function and you ask the machine learning algorithm to extrapolate the behavior of the entire function from seeing these few examples. And it's the same with puffs. Uh, you can try to attack puffs with machine learning algorithms by feeding in some of the challenge response pairs and then hoping that the machine learning algorithm extrapolates the entire behavior. But the puff should be so complex that this won't work out in practice. That's the idea. And a third feature that looks quite almost innocent or almost negligible or marginal, but which is actually very important. A third feature is that strong paths should have a publicly accessible challenge response pair interface. So everyone who holds possession of the puff or of the puff embedding hardware should be able to apply challenges and to read out the corresponding responses. There should be no access restriction. And that's actually a very important feature of strong puffs that also distinguishes them from other puff types, for example, from weak puffs, because it means that there's no isolation assumption when you use strong puffs. Um, we are used to the idea that when we build a secure system, we have to isolate something from the access of the adversary, right? We have to isolate, for example, the digital secret key in non-volatile memory so that adversaries can't access it. And that's one of the fundamental principles, how we build secure hardware in these days. But strong puffs right from the start claim something different. They say, I allow everyone to apply challenges and to read out the responses and still security shall be maintained. So this is actually quite an interesting and also revolutionary feature. Um, I think I'd like to pause here for a second and allow questions. If there are any questions or comments, please feel free um, and, and go ahead. And if there are none, no problem either, <laughs> then I'll just continue. You can always interrupt me, by the way. So if you feel that uh, you don't want to make a remark, oh, I think there's a chat message, let me see. Okay, so Jens Fries asks, how are the puff responses verified? Um, Jens, do you mean in a certain protocol how they are? Yes, that's a good point. I'll come to that in just a few slides. So that's a very good point. But I think it will be explained in four slides from now how you can use these puffs in, in an identification protocol, for example. Yes, but that's a very good point. Thanks for, thanks for posing that question. Um, any other questions? Anyone else who wants to make a comment or, or raise a question? If not, then no problem. Thanks again to Jens for the question. And then uh, let me continue. So we've explained the concept of strong paths and now let's see how they can be implemented. I will give you two implementation examples, starting with the historically first strong path, which is an optical construction that has been put forward by Ravikant Papu in his PhD thesis in 2001, and which was then also subject to a publication in the Science Magazine in 2002. I think it's really a beautiful construction, actually, a very, very elegant and, and smart and, and beautiful construction. The idea is you take a small plastic platelet of dimension one centimeter by one centimeter by 2.5 millimeters, for example. And inside this small plastic platelet, you distribute a very, very large number of very small light scattering particles. For example, you could take very, very small uh, glass spheres or glass balls of a few micrometers or perhaps a few hundred nanometers uh, in diameter. And since the dimensions of the platelet are one centimeter by one centimeter by 2.5 millimeter, you can imagine that millions or perhaps even billions of these small light scattering particles can be distributed randomly inside the platelet. 
And now when I shine a laser beam at this structure, the laser light is scattered multiple times inside the platelet. Whenever it hits one of these glass spheres or glass beads, it is scattered in all directions. So a very, very complex scattering process at these millions of scattering centers inside the puff will take place. And when you place a camera a few centimeters behind that structure, then you can record the result of this interference process and scattering process, namely an interference pattern, an optical interference pattern. And some of you might have seen that already, either during their studies or perhaps even uh, in the last years at school, because at least in my years when I was at school, this was part of our education, uh, these scattering phenomena and these interference phenomena. It's just a pattern of bright and dark spots, more or less, as you can see here. Now, why is this a puff? What makes it a puff? I think when we want to judge whether this is a puff or not, we have to talk about what the challenge is, what the response is, and what the relevant disorder is, and why the structure is unique and unclonable. So let's do that here for that example. What is the challenge? Well, the challenge is the point and the angle of incidence of the laser beam in this situation. So depending on on where the laser beam hits the structure and what the angle of incidence of the laser beam is, always a different interference pattern results. So it's natural to assume or to stipulate or to define that the point of incidence here defines the challenge of this path structure. And the response naturally then would be the interference pattern that results from this point and angle of incidence. And depending on the camera that you would use, that interference pattern would have thousands or even millions of bits actually, right? So a very, very large response with thousands or millions of bits depending on your camera. Now, why is this structure unclonable? Uh, where does the disorder come into play? Well, I think that's relatively easy to see the disorder or the randomness that we want to have in a puff are these random positions of the glass spheres. Whenever I fabricate the structure, there will be a new random configuration. So all the puffs will have a different configurations inside. And also given the current limitations of 3D nanofabrication methods, it's practically impossible to clone this structure and to fabricate two optical puffs, which are exactly the same. Now, interestingly, this structure has not been broken uh, until this day. So machine learning attacks on this puff structure or cloning attacks on this puff structure have not been reported anywhere in the literature. And um, I think that's a relatively long time frame for a cryptographic primitive, no attack within 20 years or more than 20 years. So this is really a beautiful example of successful crypto design. However, it has one catch. It has one problem. And that problem is it requires high precision measurement or high precision positioning between the puff, the laser beam, and the camera that records this interference pattern. So imagine that you would use that puff on a bank card. We'll come back to that example later on. But just imagine for now that you would use that puff on a bank card. And then you would want to measure the same challenge response pair in every cash machine or in every automated teller machine, ATM, around the world. This would be very difficult because you would have to make sure that the laser in every ATM hits the puff under exactly the same angle and in exactly the same spot so that you would get the same response. So from a practical perspective, this construction is very yeah, it's very inefficient, unfortunately. It's beautiful and elegant conceptually. It's also highly secure, had never, has never been attacked in the last 20 years, but it's not very practical, unfortunately. And for this and other reasons, people also have investigated electrical structures as strong puffs. And the most famous example here is the so-called Arbiter puff that was invented at MIT just a little bit later, maybe just one year later than the optical puff by Ravikant Papu. The group that was involved here was Srini Devadas' group, one of the most famous puff groups uh, of all times, I suppose. And they have suggested a very elegant construction um, that can be explained as follows. So as you can see, this structure here is relatively regular. It has these dotted rectangles. Inside a dotted rectangle is what we call a stage. So an orbiter puff has many stages. And there's a sequence of stages basically going from left to right, right? Everything inside this dotted rectangle is what we call a stage. There are plenty of stages. In that case, 128 stages from left to right. And then we assume that an electrical signal enters that sequence of stages from left to right, and that this electrical signal is split into two signals, a red signal in quotation marks and a green signal in quotation marks. And these two signals then traverse the structure or travel through the structure from left to right. And the paths which they take 
on their race against each other, the paths which they take are determined by external bits that are applied at the stages. If an external bit applied at a certain stage equals zero, then the top signal, the red signal in that case, remains at the top. So it enters the stage as the top signal and also leaves the stage as the top signal. And the same holds for the bottom signal. The bottom signal enters the stage as bottom signal and then leaves it as bottom signal. Whereas if we apply a one as the external bit at a certain stage, then the two signals cross paths and they exchange their positions. The top signal moves down and the bottom signal moves up. And at the very end of the structure, there is a blue box, <laughs> at least in this sketch, there is a blue box. Um, and this is an arbiter element or Schiedsrichter element in German. And this arbiter element determines whether the top signal arrived first or whether the bottom signal arrived first. So it determines who the winner of the race between these two signals from left to right eventually is. And then it correspondingly outputs a single bit, a zero or a one. If the bottom signal arrived first, it will output a one. If the top signal arrived first, it will output a zero. Now, that's as far as the operability or the functionality of the structure goes. Why is it a puff? Let's make the same game as we did on the last slide. What's the challenge? What's the response? And how does the disorder come into play? So I think it's relatively easy to see what the challenge and the response are going to be. Uh, the challenge is the sequence of these external bits that are applied at these 128 stages. And since each of these bits can be chosen independently of the other bits, there are two to the power of 128 challenges overall. So a huge number, really a huge number of challenges. Um, this means that this criterion that we had earlier on three slides ago on the definition of strong paths, namely that there should be a huge number of challenge response pairs for sure is met here, right? So two to the power of 128, this is a huge, huge, huge number. Um, and the response is simply that single bit that the arbiter element will output. So the response is, um, the response is um, defined by that single bit that is output by the latch or by this arbiter element, by this blue box, basically. Now, let's quickly talk about the disorder. I, I have a question for you. I don't know if anyone can answer that question. Um, I have a question for you. So if you look at that layout of the structure, it looks perfectly symmetric, doesn't it? All the paths are, have exactly the same length in this layout. So if, for example, this top path here from there to there and this bottom path from here to there have exactly the same length, right? And the same holds for the situation where the two paths cross each other, where the bottom path moves up and the top path moves down. So if the layout is perfectly symmetrical, and it is, why is there a winner at all in the race? So why is it not the case that both signals arrive at exactly the same point in time? Any, any ideas why, why is this the case? Um, why is there a winner at all in the race? Yes, Jens again. So thanks, Jens, for being so active. Thank you very much. Yes, also Markus Janke writes it. Yes, that's exactly right. So let me quickly read the answer that Jens and Markus gave to everyone. Jens wrote, irregularities in the wires result in different resistance. Yes, that's exactly right. And Markus writes, differences in the multiplexers. Yes, that's exactly right. Both answers are exactly right. So whenever we fabricate this structure in silicon, whenever we fabricate it in silicon, we will necessarily be subject to certain manufacturing variations. And we've seen this effect already in the brief intro that I gave. Um, you know, the, 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 the circuit is not a, a perfect thing that lives in an, in an idealized platonic world, but it's a real physical object. And as a real physical object, it's subject to manufacturing variations and to disorder um, beyond the control of the manufacturer. And these manufacturing variations cause some runtime delays for these signals. So even though the path is nominally have exactly the same length, Practically, this path, for example, will be a bit slower than that path, or this path will be a bit faster than that path. And these small runtime delays on the order of picoseconds in the end have the effect that when they sum up, when they sum up as the signals traverse from left to right through the structure, that one of the paths will be a bit faster and the other path will be a bit slower. Good, thank you. Thanks for your comments, Jens and Markus. Now, I guess most of you will be eager to learn what you can do with these strong paths. What are they good for? I think Jens's first question also hinted a bit like that. How can we use such a primitive, such a strong path in protocols and in real world applications? And let me give you one example for this. It's the most popular application of strong paths, I think, namely identification or authentication protocols on the basis of strong paths. 
And very often these protocols are phrased in a bank card setting or in a bank card context. So we would assume that there is a central authority, for example, a bank headquarter and a piece of mobile hardware, for example, the bank card. And the bank card would carry a certain strong puff S, a unique strong puff S. Um, and then we assume that both entities, the central authority and the hardware together go through a secure setup phase. And in this secure setup phase, the central authority would choose a number of challenges at random, would apply these challenges to the strong puff, would measure the corresponding responses and would write down these challenge response pairs or CRPs in a secret list that is being stored somewhere at the central authority. So you can imagine this secret list of CRPs, this CRP list as a fingerprint more or less of the strong path. It certainly does not contain all possible challenge response pairs because the strong path by definition has too many challenge response pairs to read out all of them but it contains a sufficient number in order to later identify the strong path. That's the idea. So this CRP list serves as a fingerprint by which later on the strong path can be identified. And at some point, the setup phase will close and the hardware will be given to a customer in the field, Alice, for example, and Alice will then carry around the strong path and the bank card for a while in her pocket. And at some point she might want to withdraw money from her account. And then the central authority and the hardware run a very simple challenge response pair based protocol with each other. Um, the central authority picks a number of challenges at random from this CRP list, for example, C1 and C3, sends them over to the hardware. The hardware applies these challenges to the POF, measures the corresponding responses, and then returns these measured responses, R1 and R3, to the central authority. And then the central authority compares these incoming responses to the responses that have been previously measured in the setup phase. And if they match within some pre-specified error bounds, then the central authority is going to believe the identity of the hardware. And in that case, it will authorize the money transfer. So Alice gets her money. That's the idea. Very, very simple protocol. Let's talk a bit about the adversary model, just a little bit. Of course, you know there is an adversary. Life would be too simple if there were no adversaries. And also in that case, we have an adversary. And the idea is that Evil Eve, this external adversary, can first of all, sometimes access the bank card or the piece of hardware. So we assume that she might have temporary access to the hardware. She can measure challenge response pairs uh, during that time or make any other physical or invasive attacks if she wants to. And of course, we also assume that Eve can eavesdrop that communication here. So she learns these challenge response pairs that have been used um, in each run of the identification protocol. So the least we have to do is we need to cross out these challenge response pairs that have already been used and we will not use them again. This means that this list shrinks over time, but I think that's not such a big issue because we can make sure that there are enough challenge response pairs recorded in the setup phase for the entire lifetime of the device. So I think this is really no big deal or no too big issue. Good, now it's a seemingly simple protocol. I think all of us have seen more complex protocols in their own lectures or even have given lectures where they have described far more complex protocols. But still this protocol has caused an incredible hype in the hardware security community and also in the crypto community over the last couple of years. And um, the question is why? Why did it cause such an incredible hype? And the reason are a couple of clearly defined advantages which this protocol has. The first advantage is it induces no digital secret keys in the hardware. So there are obviously no digital secret keys in the bank card, which is great because it um, breaks up with a paradigm that has been active in the area for decades really. Namely, that if you want to identify yourself remotely over digital communication lines, you have to store, permanently store a digital secret key in your hardware. And this is not the case here. So we surmount to overcome that long-standing decade-old paradigm. That's interesting. And it also has a clear security implication because these permanently stored digital secret keys always are among the Achilles heels or main attack vectors on hardware. And this main attack vector is overcome by this construction. So I, I think I could not overemphasize that. This is really a, a major and, and a disruptive innovation, I think, in my opinion, and really justifies the hype that has been around PUFFs for, for a couple of decades now. 
Now, another advantage that always um, interested me uh, as a theoretician very much, I'm originally a mathematician, um, as Professor Schulman already mentioned in the introduction, what we can avoid here are the standard unproven computational assumptions like the assumed hardness of the discrete logarithm or of the factoring problem. Let me take a sip of water. So we avoid these standard computational assumptions. Of course, we are based on other assumptions. So puffs are not assumption free. And I think no cryptographic scheme is assumption free. But we create an independent fundament for protocols like these by using puffs that is independent of the assumed hardness of the discrete log or factoring problem. So we are also post quantum secure. I think that's interesting. You could see strong puffs also as a post quantum primitive actually. Now, these are two advantages with respect to external adversaries. Now, let's turn to one or two practicality advantages. Uh, one consequence of the fact that you don't have a secret key in your mobile hardware is that you also don't need NVM. So you can save process steps, you can save costs. Um, I think that's an important advantage. And if you use optical puffs, then you do not even need any electronics in the hardware. So you are in a situation where you can have a piece of hardware in the Internet of Things without any electronics on board, and still that piece of hardware can identify itself remotely over digital communication lines. Of course, you need electronic equipment around it. You need a measurement apparatus for optical puffs around it that directs the laser beam at the puff and that records the response. But um, this does not involve any electronics in the hardware itself, fortunately. And as a fifth advantage and last advantage, even malicious manufacturers cannot clone the strong puff. So the idea here is, or the advantage is, that you can delimit um, the impact that a malicious manufacturer has in such a situation. So if we quickly take a look at our two old friends, the external adversary, Evil Eve, and the malicious manufacturer, then um, their possibilities actually fade away at least a little bit. Uh, and in some situations, and in some ideal scenarios, vanilla scenarios, they might even lose their ability to attack these puff schemes completely. Good. Any questions? I think that's the last time that I'm going to pause um, uh, throughout the talk for, for intermediate questions. Any questions on, on this particular scheme or any comments also, if you want. I hope, Jens, that your concern was, was answered beca because you early on had that concern about how can you identify the path if there's just one instance or just one specimen, and that's how you do it, basically. So you use that CRP list. Um, any other comments? Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Let me quickly take a look at that. Okay, good. So Jens says all cleared up. Any other comments or questions on that on that scheme? Um, something that people sometimes ask is, will it always be two challenge response pairs that are being used here? And it's not always two challenge response pairs. This is just a symbolic representation of the protocol. Um, for an optical puff with many thousands response bits, you can only use a single challenge response pair in this identification. If you would use an arbiter puff, which only delivers a single bit as response, then you might want to use maybe one, 100, 100 change response pairs in the protocol. Good. Then let me move on. Um, you cannot only use strong puffs for identification or authentication, but you can also use it for many other things. That's an insight that, especially within the last 10 years, um, has surfaced in the puff community. Uh, you can also use strong puffs for key exchange, oblivious transfer, bit commitment, secure multi-party computation. So strong puffs are not just a hardware security tool, but really a universal cryptographic primitive. And I think it's fair to say that it all started with a paper in 2010, in which I also was involved, that showed that oblivious transfer can be based on physical unclonable functions. And then there was a sequence of follow-up works also at the top venues of the crypto uh, community, Eurocrypt and Crypto and Journal of Cryptology, where this idea of you know, a universal cryptographic primitive was further unfolded. So these are really very powerful tools, uh, very powerful tools that can be used for many things. Now, as always in life, there's a price tag associated to this. Um, and the price tag is that you have to be very careful with the design of these strong puffs. Because if you use too simple designs, then so-called machine learning attacks or modeling attacks loom. And in these modeling attacks, the adversary Eve does not attempt to physically clone the puff because that's impossible to make a perfect atomic scale reproduction of the puff. That is not going to work. But instead, Eve um, fabricates a so-called digital clone 
which is nothing else than a trained machine learning algorithm. Um, the, this machine learning algorithm is being fed a few general response pairs of the puff. And then the hope is that the machine learning algorithm will learn how the puff behaves on the entire CRP space and that it can predict the behavior on the entire CRP space. And unfortunately for the POF community, this works incredibly well, at least for these Arbiter POF structures. Here is a table from uh, one of the papers that I was involved in also. And as you can see, you can achieve prediction rates of 95% with just a few hundred CRPs and prediction rates of more than 99% with a few thousand CRPs. And the training times in both cases are less than one second. So you can almost do it on a, on a pocket calculator or especially on a smartphone. You could break this path here easily with, with a smartphone, even with a smartphone that is 10 years old, I assume. So that's bad news. Um, and this was quite a shock for the Puff community when these you know, um, very, very efficient machine learning attacks were discovered. But at the same time, not all hope is lost. And I think that's a very important message to send here. Not all hope is lost because if you design your Puff sufficiently complex, then of course no machine learning attacks will be possible because machine learning is not a magic or indefinitely strong tool. It also has its limits. And this optical path that we already discussed earlier has never been broken, has never been attacked successfully. I've already mentioned it. And this means that machine learning plays really a pivotal role for strong path research in these days because it defines the borderline between machine learnable and therefore insecure and non-machine learnable and therefore secure puffs. And of course, the design goal is to be on the right side of this borderline, which is not so simple and which has kept us busy over the last 10 or 15 years. But we've made progress, that's for sure. Good. So that's as far as I wanted to talk about um, physical disorder and IoT security, and in particular about strong puffs. And now let me give just a few quick research spotlights. What am I doing in these days? What's my research all about in these days? Uh, and as I said, it would be very brief and in a flashlight type style. So the first area um, that I'm very active in together with a couple of colleagues is to construct secure silicon strong puffs to be on the right side of this machine learning borderline that I just defined a few slides ago. And um, we are trying to, to follow two avenues here. We're trying to follow two avenues. First avenue is uh, we're trying to use the Arbiter puff in more complex architectures with a couple of design tricks. Um, a second avenue is we're trying to become truly two-dimensional. So if you think about the Arbiter Puff from an abstract perspective, it's very linear and it's unidirectional. The signals only travel from left to right, right? And what we're trying to investigate here is a, a grid of single cells and these cells are interacting with all their neighboring cells and they're interacting in both directions. So you would have an equilibrium process inside such a complex two-dimensional array going on. And that promises more complexity, of course, than the simple plane orbiter path structure. But even here, of course, machine learning is the big opponent. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we have made very strong progress. And let me illustrate that progress to you quickly by showing one table from publication number 10 here. So as you can see, this structure, which is called interpose path, requires 300 million, 300 million CRPs to be broken and computation times of several weeks. <laughs> so you can compare the situation of the plane orbiter puff where we had computation times of less than one second and a few hundred or a few thousand CRPs sufficing for an attack to this situation where we need weeks on a high performance cluster and hundreds of millions of CRPs in the training phase of the machine learning algorithm. So I think it's fair to say that after 10 or 15 years, we've been able to push machine learning to the edge. What could be done 15 years ago with a pocket calculator now requires a high performance cluster and hundreds of millions of CRPs. And I think there is hope that in the next design cycles, in the next five years or so, we will finally not only push machine learning to the edge, but push it over the edge and that we will finally have secure strong paths then. Um, and then when you think about it historically, <laughs> we were not even that slow in the Puff community, right? So AES has an evolution of 2000 years. It all started with the CESAR cipher 2000 years ago. Um, and with strong puffs, I think there is hope that after 20 years or 25 years, we finally will have strong and secure architectures. So let's see what happens. It's always hard to predict the future, of course, but um, that's my hope. I think in five years, we might have strong and secure architectures in the end. 
And I'm following this thread with a couple of colleagues, um, Martin van Dijk, really um, also a personal friend uh, and a long-term collaborator who was also involved in the very first PUF works uh, over 20 years ago in Srini Devadas' group. And then also a few folks from Stanford, Boris Moorman, Sarah Ecker, and also a couple of people from LMU. Um, of course, there are also machine learners, Per Kröger and Gita Kutinuk, they are responsible for the machine learning side here. Good, then let's jump to the next topic, honest and malicious remote sensing. Um, so PUF CRPs may not only depend on physical disorder, but also on environmental parameters like temperature, for example. And this usually makes them unstable and appears as a disadvantage at first glance. So let me quickly show you one structure that we invented in Munich about 10 years ago. This structure is quite interesting, I think, for a number of reasons, but it has this disadvantage of having around 10% unstable CRPs. So 10% of these CRPs are unstable. Um, we thought initially that's a disaster and you know almost kicked it to the bin. But then we realized that this opens up new applications because these 10% unstable CRPs mostly depend on temperature or nothing else. So it's mostly temperature that influences these 10% unstable CRPs. So you can use them for temperature sensing. <laughs> you can use this relatively unstable strong puff for puff based sensing. And we were very happy when we had that insight. Um, because that allows you to build a secure temperature sensor without secret keys on board. So this puff acts as an authentication mechanism and as a thermometer at the same time, key-free temperature sensor. That's the interesting thing about it. We then realized, however, that this goes both ways. So it's really a two-edged sword. You can exploit the temperature dependence of puffs for building new secure sensors, but you can also use it for spying on temperature in the Internet of Things because DRAMs have the same behavior. DRAMs are also PUFFs or DRAM behavior can be exploited as PUFF and DRAMs are present in most devices in the Internet of Things and their behavior is temperature dependent. So you can, at least under certain circumstances, I'd like to emphasize that under certain circumstances, you can use the DRAMs um, in your system uh, to spy remotely on the temperature of a certain device. And I think that's a bad thing. So it's a two-edged sword. And I wanted to include this example because it shows so nicely the possibilities, but also the problems of this convergence between the physical world and the digital world. I think this is a typical example for this convergence. And here are a couple of collaborators of mine. If you want to, you can take a look at these recent ePrints. So there are two ePrints from 2022 from last year where we unfolded that idea of spying in the Internet of Things by using DRAM behavior. Good, let's jump to the next topic. As I said, it goes very quickly now, anti-counterfeiting and physical disorder. Um, I don't know if you knew that the international trade in counterfeited or pirated products is huge. It's a three digit billion euro figure, a huge number. Um, it represents 3.3% of the world's trade. And the question is, can we do something about it? And especially, can we do something about it by using puffs? And maybe you can already guess, uh, one smart idea is to use puffs as an unforgeable label, uh, as a very secure and unclonable and non-duplicable label. And you can tag this puff then to a certain medicament. Viagra is the most faked medicament in the world. That's why I took it here as an example. Um, so you can tag your puff to that package, to that medicament, and then you add some cryptographic spice. You're using digital signatures in a smart way. And then you can construct a labeling scheme where neither the label itself contains a digital secret key nor the testing apparatus. So neither the label itself nor the testing apparatus contains a secret. And this is, of course, in opposition to standard techniques like RFID tags, right? If you would use an RFID tag here, then your RFID tag would have to store a digital secret key. This is not the case here when you use POFs. The only secret key that you have to use is safely at a trusted third party, like Pfizer, for example, um, where you can store that key offline and, and very securely. And the same technique can be used for all kinds of things, for passports, ID cards, banknotes, um, for forgery proof tagging of any branded product. It always works offline, so you can verify the label offline, and it works without secret keys in the label or in the testing apparatus. And these are a couple of colleagues who are following up with me on that idea. As you can see, it takes a lot of equipment and machinery to work in that area because you have to make real physical measurement. But Jörg Beverstorff has it all. He has all the machinery available. And 
There are a couple of colleagues from LMU as well, Tim Liedl, Philipp Tinefeld, uh, Theobald Lohmiller, etc. Now, most people are trying to go small in these days in path research. They're trying to use nanostructures and smaller and smaller structures, but you can also go big. You can also use entire rooms as strong paths. And you can use the fact that every room is unclonable too. All the walls, the ceilings, the floor of a room is unclonable. Every object that is in the room is unclonable. And you can use this in order to protect, for example, the Mona Lisa. Um, so you would have a radio wave source in the gallery where the Mona Lisa is situated. You would have a detector. And then you use the complex radio wave scattering process inside the gallery in order to detect whether anyone has entered the room or whether anyone has removed an object from the room. And especially this security against removing objects from the room is also useful in nuclear arms control and in disarmament treaties. Unfortunately, the world has developed in the last one or two years in such a way that these disarmament treaties will become more and more and more important again in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, and you can use the fact that such a warhead container is also a puff in order to protect um, the weapons that are stored there against abuse. So you can use it for disarmament control. And this is something that we also follow up on with a couple of colleagues, Alexander Glaser from Princeton. We also made it to the Rubin magazine, which is the university magazine at Ruhr University of Bochum. There's Christoph Paar there and uh, Christian Zenger. And yeah, again, machine learning plays an important role, of course, and Stefan Ilium at LMU is involved here. And also I'm involved, of course, in, in doing some of that machine learning research. Good, and last but not least, um, optical puffs and puff capsules. Um, our idea or our vision here is to build a system by using optical puff technology where we surround or encapsulate a computer chip by an optical puff medium. Um, and the hope is to get something that is as secure as some of these leading devices, IBM 4767, which is certified as FIPS POP uh, 142 level four, which is the highest available level in commercial devices. But the hope is that we can do it much smaller, much lighter and without battery. So if you have a puff layer or puff encapsulation around the system, then we hope to get the same security, but smaller, lighter and without battery. So these systems could then serve as security anchors in the IoT in an ideal fashion. And what I like very much about this type of research is that it overlaps very strongly with material science research. So the capsule that we build around the chip should, for example, crumble when somebody drills into it or when somebody tampers with it. It should also, perhaps also have yet other um, properties like being electrically reconfigurable in certain applications. So this type of research are called security materials, developing materials that have certain security features that are useful in one way or the other in the Internet of Things. And I think that this will be a very active area in the next 10 years or so. And again, a couple of colleagues are working with me on that, Hui Zhao from Yale, who's really a perfect collaboration partner, and also Ben Fuller from the University of Connecticut and, and many others. Good. I think this closes the research spotlights and the summary will just be two or three minutes. I'm sorry, I think I'm a bit over time, but we also had questions ongoing. Um, so I hope that's okay. Um, so let's summarize. Let's wrap things up. Um, I hope that I could convince you that physical disorder is not just a nuisance, uh, but actually a very powerful and omnipresent security resource. It can help you to overcome certain limits of classical security art hardware, especially in the IoT. And it can help us to build secure systems in a new way, in such a way that there are no permanently stored digital secret keys in the system. And this delimits the attack vectors that our external adversary, Evil Eve, and also malicious manufacturers have. So it delimits these attack vectors, makes them fade out sometimes, and in ideal situation, it even eradicates these attack vectors completely. One important point that I wanted to make is that I only discussed a subset of possible topics. So in fact, there's a much larger design space to explore. And I'd be happy to discuss that offline. So if anyone you know wants to write me an email or discuss later on, I'd be happy about such a discussion. Today, we've only covered strong puffs from that huge puff zoo. And we've only uh, mostly dealt with security without classical secrets. But there are other puffs. And there are also other goals that we can try to achieve with PATH technology, for example, fully secret-free security or trust-free security, 
if you find that interesting, then, you know, maybe you want to have a look at one of these papers. There are also new symbols that are being used for a fully secret free. So it's not just that symbol, but we also have new symbols uh, lurking around the corner. Last thought of the talk. Um, when I was preparing the talk, I was thinking that the IoT in the end is about the convergence of the physical and the digital world. And the manifold security challenges that the IoT is faced with arise exactly from this fact. It's from that convergence of the physical and the digital world. And now you might say, okay, that's a bad thing. So we don't want the physical world <laughs> in our security architectures, but we have no choice. There is this convergence. But fortunately, the disease is also the cure in that case, because physics not just allows new attacks, but also provides a very rich toolbox for re-establishing digital security. For example, we've covered in this talk and we've discussed at length that phenomena like physical disorder and physical unclonability are tremendously helpful, um, and so is nanotechnology and the design of special materials that have special security features that make them interesting to use. So physics is not just the disease, but it's also the cure. And I think that's the final thought by which I would like to conclude. Thanks very much for coming. Um, thanks for being uh, with us and happy to take any questions now. <laughs>